Let's bow our heads. Now, O oh Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for yourself. Even now, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we just celebrated Valentine's Day a few days ago. Did everybody have a nice Valentine's Day? Everybody happy? No? I thought I'd share a little story in kind, uh, keeping with that theme of Valentine's Day here as I begin this morning, a story about a young man who called his mother. He called his mother and he excitedly announced that he had just met the woman of his dreams, woman of his dreams. And his mother said, he wanted ideas, so his mother said, well, why don't you send her flowers? Send her flowers and invite her to your apartment for a home-cooked meal. You're over there for a home-cooked meal. Well, the day after the big date, his mother called to see how things had gone. Well, Mom, the evening was a complete disaster, he replied. It was horrible. It's actually horrible. Well, the mother asked, what? why? D didn't she come over? And he said, yes, she came over, but she refused to cook. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Stories told of a pastor that got up in the pulpit and apologized for the Band-Aid on his face. The pastor said, I was thinking about my sermon, I was thinking about my sermon while shaving, and I ended up cutting my face. And afterward, the treasurer found a note in the collection plate. It read, next time, think about your face and cut the sermon. <laughs> oh. So with that, let's get underway here. Many of us have had them, uh, to be sure. Many of us have had them, those times. Those times when we felt like we were on top of the world. Raise your hand if you've ever had that feeling. You're on top of the world, everything's going your way. We've all had that. We're really happy. We're really confident that we knew all the answers. Things couldn't be going better that we could solve any problem that ever came up, or we felt that we were really close to God, really in tune, really in tune with God's plan for us. And in those moments, we were excited to be alive, and everything seemed brand new. The moment might have come at some exciting time or some exciting event, in your life, graduation, baptism, your first kiss, your first day on your first job, your wedding, the birth of a child, even catching your very first fish, might have been something spiritual. Could have been something spiritual like a week at church camp or a church retreat or your walk to Emmaus weekend. Or it might have been something of a smaller, quieter na nature, like a very intimate conversation with your father or mother when you felt that they finally, honestly understood what you were saying and why you felt the way you did. We call these... Mountaintop experiences. Mountaintop experiences, and oh, how we hate, hate to come down off that mountain. We want to hang on to that moment for as long as we can, each and every one of us. Let's just stay right here and let the rest of the world go by for a while, we say. But friends, to, to freeze that moment, to freeze that moment in time shuts off the possibility of the next moment. 
in the gospel reading for this morning. In the gospel reading for today, we hear the writer of Matthew give his version of the event that which we call, of course, the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, Mark and Luke also contain an account of this strange, strange occurrence with more or less detail in the telling. It's one of those rare moments, rare moments we were just talking about. One of those mountaintop experiences of life which somehow defy adequate description and challenge us to stretch our concept of reality to the point that we usually wind up asking the question, did this really happen? Events such as the transfiguration somehow connect us, connect us with the, the mystery, the mystery of creation and eternity. For Jesus, of course, it was a time of confirmation, confirmation and affirmation of his ministry. For Peter, James, and John, it was a brief glimpse of the transcendent, a peek at the reality that lies just beyond everyday routine life. But notice, but notice here in the passage that Jesus quickly led the disciples right back down off that mountaintop in spite of Peter's strong, strong desire to pitch a tent and camp there for a long time. Jesus led them back into the daily routine of teaching and preaching and caring for the broken and caring for the hurting people of the world they lived in, back to the reality of life in the valley. And that leads us to ask another question. Just what is reality anyway. And who defines it? Is reality just a concept? Is it just a concept as comedian Robin Williams suggested? Is the mountaintop moment itself the ultimate reality with its air of celebration and glimpses of glory? Or is reality the messy muddling of everyday life? Or is it the hope of salvation, where every tear is wiped away? Or is it the fears and tears we encounter every single day we live? What's reality in the church? Is it our prayers? Our hymns of worship? Our confessions of faith? Our hope of heaven some sweet day? Or is it the acts of kindness, words of encouragement, and other concrete expressions of our faith on ordinary days like today? I remember reading somewhere that reality is where Jesus and human beings come into contact. Where Jesus and human beings come into contact. I like that. I wish I could remember who wrote it so I could give them proper credit. But what does that mean? What does that mean? Reality is where Jesus and human beings come into contact. What does that mean? Well, you know what I think? I think it means, and I'm borrowing from the imagery of the Apostle Paul here to be sure, that when we turn to Jesus, allowing him to be our model, allowing him to be our guide, we begin to see life much more clearly. The, the veil, the veil that the scriptures speak of that prevents us from seeing clearly in our self-contained agendas is taking away and our vision of reality comes into much sharper focus. There's still going to be, still going to be a little bit of fuzziness around the edges but if we want to get a clearer image of the reality of life, we would do well to look to Jesus. And when we look to Jesus, what do we find? On the one hand, we find a Jesus who takes us up to those dizzying heights 
of the mountaintop, those intense moments in the hospital room or at church camp or when we fall in love or when we feel that we're truly forgiven. Fred Craddock tells a story about a young minister. He just got out of seminary, newly graduated. He's serving his first church. He gets a call. He gets a call telling him that a church member, an elderly woman who has just given her life to the church, is in the hospital. And she's so weak, she's so weak she can barely get out of bed. And the doctors don't hold much hope. They don't, don't hold much hope for her recovery at all. Would he go up and visit? Well, of course he will, and he does. So all the way to the hospital, he's thinking to himself about, what is he going to say? What is he going to say to this Christian lady? What words of comfort he can give her to prepare her for her imminent death? He arrives at the hospital. He goes up to her room for the visit. He sits and talks with her for a, a few minutes, just small talk, really, nothing earth-shattering. When he makes ready to leave, he asks if she would like him to have prayer for her. And she answers, oh, yes, of course. That's why I wanted you to come. And he then asks politely, and what exactly would you like me to pray for? Well, I want you to pray that God will heal me. She answers in a surprised tone of voice. So haltingly, fumbling over the words, he prays. He prays just as she wanted, that God will heal her, even though he's not really sure that can happen. When he says the amen, at the end of the prayer, the woman says, you know what? I think it worked. I think it worked. I think I'm healed. And she gets out of bed and begins to run up and down the hallway of the hospital shouting, praise God, I'm healed. Praise God, I'm healed. Well, meanwhile, meanwhile, the young minister in a stupor stumbles to the stairwell, walks down five flights of stairs, makes his way to the parking lot and somehow manages to find his car. And as he fumbles for his car keys, to get them out of his pocket, he looks heavenward and says, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> he had a mountaintop moment, but he didn't have a clue what to do with it. But the same Jesus who leads us to those spiritual high places also leads us to care for the hurting, the broken-hearted children, to minister to the homeless, to bind up the wounds of a broken world, or simply to tend to the needs of a brother or sister. Jesus is there. Jesus is there in that foul-smelling hospital corridor. Jesus is there within the fears and the tears of everyday life. Jesus is there in the joy of the birth of a child. And Jesus is there in the aching loneliness of the shut-in. Jesus is there in the repeated failures of his followers. And he's there in the successes also. Reality is where Jesus and human beings come into contact. And as we, as we look closely... As we look closely, we discover that Jesus not only encountered human beings both in the extraordinary and in the routine, but he repeatedly let them, led them where they did not want to go. He often did that. He said, behold, I make things new. I make all things new, says Jesus. And suddenly all our wonderful plans to earn our way into the kingdom of God are swept away with the promise of grace and grace alone, the power of the cross and the offer of salvation as a free gift. And suddenly, suddenly we're supposed to serve those people that we want to lead. And suddenly, we're supposed to pray for those people who hate us. 
and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive again. And people who we've never seen, living in countries whose names we can scarcely spell, much less pronounce, are declared to be suddenly our brothers in the literal sense and our sisters in Christ. That's reality? Reality is where Jesus and human beings come and get to contact. Now, wherever that is, wherever it may lead, you can be sure that love is there. God is love, remember? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Love one another as I have loved you. Love is the heart, the beating heart of reality. You and I are truly loved. That's what happens when there's contact between Jesus and and the human being, whether it's up on the mountaintop or in the ordinary of everyday life or down in the lowest, lowest valley, whether in crucifixion or in resurrection, reality. Reality is where Jesus and human beings come into contact in your pain, in your pain, in your joy, in your grief, or in your celebrations, in your visionary hopes, or in the daily grind of ordinary life. Jesus is there in love. And living in his love, we become real. Real. That, my friends, is the ultimate reality. And all God's people said,